Okay, thank you all for coming back to this third session. It's been a really thrilling day. And this next panel is going to be about using archives. And now that we have these two archives, how are put it, people putting them to use? Whether they're going online and listening to an oral history or they're coming uh, into the library and actually engaging with materials, what are they finding? What kinds of projects are they using our materials to support? And what's the experience of being in the archives and working with the process of discovery? What's that like? So those are the things that this panel is going to engage with. And the moderator for this panel is Jasmine Waddell, class of 1999, who's resident dean of freshmen at Harvard College, where she serves as the academic and residential dean for 400 first-year students. Before coming to Harvard, Jasmine taught environmental policy and developmental studies at colleges and universities, including Brandeis, Boston College, and the University of Nevada, Los Angeles, and she continues to publish in those fields. Her most recent article, Employment Change Among Hurricane Katrina Evacuees, Impacts of Race and Place, was featured in the Journal of Public Management and Social Policy in 2015. Jasmine earned her PhD in social policy at the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Welcome, Jasmine, to moderate this panel. Uh, thanks so much, Jean, and thanks everybody who's um, still here. What an amazing day. Um, I, I, this intellectual stimulation on overload. Um, so um, I hope, I can't wait to hear um, from our panel. Um, but before I do that, I just want to thank uh, Jean once again for the introduction. Um, it's an honor for me to be ushered uh, into the Pembroke Center community as well as into this panel by somebody who is such a scholarly giant. Um, Victoria did an great job of introducing um, Jean earlier today um, and talking about all of her phenomenal contributions to the Academy. Um, but I also wanted to highlight um, something else that directly connects to what we're going to be talking about. So in addition to being a prolific scholar and authoring more than 50 essays and five books, she's also the recipient of a Guggenheim, American Council of Learned Societies, and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, in the Huntington, Folger, and Newberry Library Fellowships. So as a teacher, um, Jean also has won awards at both Syracuse University, where she was for a while, and then also where she um, is now, which is Columbia. And those awards are for teaching and mentoring of graduate students. Something that our archives do is they give um, some fodder for undergraduate students and for graduate students and help them to, to launch their careers and to make an impact on the academy themselves. So Jean has really been um, pivotal um, in understanding the connection between archives, um, research, and the academy um, and empowering women and men all, all, all across the way um, and helping them to understand the value of, of, of the F word, feminism. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, um, to, to celebrate uh, Jean again. Um, um, now I would like to introduce you to our illustrious panel. Um, we have uh, uh, something that we haven't had yet, um, which is a live undergraduate student um, who, uh, who I am excited um, to introduce. Um, so uh, our first, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going in order, um, but uh, these, these folks are all preeminent, um, fear not. Uh, so our first panelist, or the first panelist that I'll talk about is our live undergraduate student. Um, she, she woke up for us and she's joining us today. Uh, we're very excited. <laughs> Um, her name is Shira Buxbaum. Um, she uh, uh, is currently a sophomore, um, and she's likely to concentrate in English. I know that will make a number of the people in the audience happy. Um, and she writes for the Brown Daily Herald, uh, which is pretty exciting. We've heard a lot about the impact of that particular publication on our understanding of the lives of women at Brown. Um, so she currently is writing for the, for the BDH. Um, in her first year at Brown, Shira conducted a research project using the Mary Elizabeth Sharp papers, which are part of the Christine Dunlop Farnham icon archive on the history of women at Brown and in Rhode Island. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Mary 
Elizabeth Sharp uh, earned an honorary AM degree in, uh, at Brown University in 1950 and was interested in landscape architecture and city beautiful projects at Brown and in Providence, Rhode Island. So we look forward to her insights. The next, uh, the next panelist who I'm going to introduce is uh, Peter uh, Maklouf. Um, he is a class of 16. Uh, he's a former Pembroke Center undergraduate fellow. Uh, Peter comes to us today from Germany. Um, he, uh, after being an undergraduate uh, fellow at the Pembroke Center, he's become close um, with Suzanne and uh, Denise Davis. As his research moved from the study of Naomi um, Shore, who we heard a lot about earlier today, um, to um, looking at uh, the history of the Pembroke Center and the Differences Journal. So he helps us to understand the work that we're doing um, and two very important contributions to how we understand women's lives at Brown. Um, so we look forward to hearing, I look forward to hearing uh, more about his experiences with that. The next panelist is Michelle Scully. Um, Michelle is a citizen researcher um, of the Brown Women Speak Oral History Project, which we haven't heard as much about today. Um, and uh, she's here on behalf of the Hearthside House and Museum. A volunteer, as a volunteer at that museum, Michelle helped to produce the exhibit, uh, The Decade That Roared, a 1920s Rhode Island experience, which utilized samples from the 1920s era grad graduates of Pembroke. Um, so that will be very, very exciting as well. Um, the last two panelists, uh, the first is Lauren um, Gilmet. She's an assistant professor of philosophy at the Florida Atlantic University. So we uh, generated some snow so that she would feel like she had really accomplished something today. Um, <laughs> So Lauren is a scholar of uh, Teresa Brennan, a feminist uh, theorist whose papers are part of the Feminist Theory Archive. Um, Lauren um, visited Brown about a year ago to research the Brennan papers. And during that visit, she discovered a never before um, seen unpublished manuscript uh, within that collection. This discovery is a major breakthrough uh, for scholarship um, on Brennan and has affected Lauren's uh, scholarship greatly. Um, and it really, it has affected the world greatly. So um, I'm really excited to hear more about that. And then um, our final panelist is Amy uh, Car Karwowski. Um, Amy is a Brown uh, alum as well. Um, uh, she did extensive research for her senior uh, thesis using the Brown Women Speak oral histories, which are part of the Christine uh, Dunlap Farnham archive. The focus of her research was on the Brown Daily Herald and the newspaper's outing of a campus physician who was distributing birth control to female students in, 1960, in 1965 against campus policy. Um, so very, very interesting. Amy has continued her scholarship of history uh, and now focuses on uh, public history where her dissertation, right now she's uh, a PhD student. She graduated from, uh, uh, with an AM um, from Brown in 2012. And uh, now she's a student at New York University. Um, and she's working with the uh, New York Historical Society. Um, her research has continued, her scholarship has continued, um, and now focuses on public history, where her dissertation deals with the role of storytelling in contemporary Native American education. Amy might well, um, Amy's gonna talk to us about that research and, um, and the work that she's been doing. So thank you so much to all of the panelists. Um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. <laughs> Um, all right, thank you. So uh, I want to get this kicked off. Um, as I said, um, you know, you all have uh, phenomenal histories and have worked with these um, archives. So I'm, I'm wondering, how did you discover them? Um, so some of you worked with Christine Dunlap, uh, Dunlap Farnham. Some of you worked with the Feminist Theory Archive. How did you discover them? Was it word of mouth? Um, what, what, what was the thing that, that led you to these um, and want to work with them? Um, I'm pretty sure I never would have known they existed like most events on campus. I didn't have Facebook in the era when things were mostly online, but I did take several classes. I took um, 
Beth Taylor's nonfiction, historical nonfiction writing class. And she actually <laughs> Yeah. She actually brought us over um, to the archives and I think I didn't leave for about a week and a half. So um, I was pretty lucky and found a lot of a lot of pretty cool stuff in there. Great. I um, had a similar experience my freshman fall, which is when I conducted my research on Mary Elizabeth Sharp. I had the good fortune of taking an English nonfiction class with Kate Shapira, and she insisted for one of our writing pieces that we use the archives to some extent. Uh, and I found the Sharp papers through the online database and then requested to use them, which was an exciting experience. Hmm. Anybody else? So um, with the Hearthside House, which is in, in Lincoln, Rhode Island, we do multiple events. And the event that we did the year before was the 1904 World's Fair. And one of the biggest things that was most in, impactful were the oral histories. So when we were decided to do the Decade That Roared, a 1920s Rhode Island experience, uh, we were like, let's find ed oral histories from Rhode Island. And we were searching on the internet and um, Kathy Hartley, the, fa the founder, was like, I found this, can um, I've, the brown women speak? Can you research for this for me, look it up, see what we can find? And I got the honor of talking um, with the people at Pembroke and be like, can I download these? Can I listen to everything? And I got it. And it was just a wonderful experience to hear all of those um, oral histories. Um, the two people who were on before, Joanna and Mimi, you don't know the powerful experience that that's going to hold for someone a hundred years from now. Um, and it's going to be as emotional a, a, of an experience as it was hearing it as it was to do it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Michelle. I, I'm curious if you think how you think it would be different um, in terms of, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering how you think um, it would be different to be absorbing these um, in a written um, format versus um, in, the, in the oral, um, because you talk about how impactful that was and how powerful that was. I'm wondering if you can talk about what you see as the difference between um, absorbing the material in those two different formats. It's definitely a different experience from reading than hearing it. Uh, because while you're reading it, you say, um, for example, I did the 1920s. Oh, they had speakeasies in Providence. Mm -hmm. OK, that's just a blatant sentence. But hearing it, you get the tone of voice. You get the emotion behind it. You get the fear of, um, mm. of uh, the, like, the liquor being you, what, being afraid of drinking the liquor, you get the someone. With, I got to hear someone singing um, a jazz song. You get to hear the joy behind that. You get um, the um, oh, you're not supposed to do the Charleston because it's not a proper dance. That sounds so much more better than um, oh, people did the Charleston. You get that extra oomph that. And that's what, and I haven't, hadn't seen them or heard them in about a year, and I still mm -hmm. can remember the, the way they said it, the, the power, the impact that it had on me, and I won't forget it. Though I could forget, I've forgotten a lot from doing all that research, but I won't forget these because the emotion just adds just another layer onto what you're learning, and it's powerful. It's more powerful than you'll ever know. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of leads me to thinking about um, the feminist theory archives and the Christine Dunlop Farnham and your, oh, sorry. That gets me to thinking, I apologize. Um, that gets me to thinking about um, the physical experience of going to a reading room. Um, so Shira, I'm really curious to hear what your experience is like. So being on campus now, what is it like to go into a reading room, particularly now when I imagine that the majority of your research is online, but I think that's true for all scholars. Um, so, so what's that been like? So the, the John Hay is just a, it, 
it's the epitome of a classic collegiate library. It's just, it's, it's gorgeous. I assume that at some point in, in time it will be used in a film. It's, I personally don't yeah. frequent the John Hay um, for my regular studying, so using it to do special research adds, the, it adds to the, the experience, the ambiance mm -hmm. of the building um, is really overwhelming in, in some respects, especially mm -hmm. when um, I first entered when I was a freshman. Um, that was my first experience handling old papers, I, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, and walking into the quiet special reading room, I don't know how many of you have been in there, it's, um, it's very tranquil, it's very sterile, and it was totally overwhelming and intimidating, and I, I, didn't really, I didn't really know how to handle myself because there was no one there to guide me, but sitting down after the, um, one of the specialists brought out all of the papers, I think I... I asked, I requested four boxes of um, Mary Elizabeth Sharp's papers. There are 20 boxes of her documents. She was an incredibly uh, meticulous note taker, which I can talk about later if it's uh, so relevant. Um, and it, they came out on a cart and I one by one picked up her, the boxes of her life essentially and laid them out on the table. Um, and that's when all of the fear sort of trickled away because suddenly I had this person in front of me. Um, Mary Elizabeth Sharp died in the mid-2000s. She lived to be 101 years old. Um, and everything, everything of, of her was kept in these boxes. So the experience of being in this gorgeous room um, as a very scared, shy freshman girl who, who didn't really understand what college was going to do for her and still doesn't really know what college is going to do for her. Um, <laughs> and, and doing that research for the first time and being able to handle those, so, those documents so intimately uh, was a really profound experience. Um, of course, if I had if I'd gotten to do it in The Rock, I'm sure that I, I would have fallen in love with the documents in the same way, but I think the the pristinity and the the tranquility of the room added to the experience tenfold. Um, that that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I and I'm sitting here thinking, do you think it's going to have an impact on the way that you pursue the rest of your Brown experience and perhaps post Brown experience? Oh, I I would hope so. I think. Mm -hmm. um, too often I'm stuck in my room doing readings on my computer, which I find very tiresome. Um, as Dean Waddell mentioned, I'm studying, I'm studying English on fiction and anthropology, so I do a lot of reading. Um, and I'm definitely the type of person who wants to have printed pieces in front of me. I don't enjoy looking on screens, and I think having that experience so early in my college tenure it definitely encouraged me to pursue printed documents, whether they're secondary sources in the form of books or the, those primary sources. Um, and while that experience in particular didn't necessarily turn me towards academia, um, in my time since, I've very seriously considered pursuing uh, graduate school and academia in general, in which case I, I should hope and expect that I will be doing further research that requires this interaction with primary documents. Great. Um, so, so this reminds me of the work that Lauren did and what she accomplished um, as, a, as a scholar. I would love to hear more about uh, the discovery that you made, how it came about, what you think it means, um, and how it's influenced your scholarship. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Pull it closer? Okay. Like that? Okay. Um, hello. Um, so my experience was a little different. I had no connection to Brown before coming to the archive. Um, I graduated from Emory with a PhD in philosophy in 2014. And I did my dissertation work on affect theory and feminist philosophy. And I got a job at Florida Atlantic University, and I presumed, right, because I'd read Teresa Brennan's book, her, um, so Teresa Brennan was a feminist philosopher, psychoanalytic theorist, and she wrote this book um, that was published posthumously in 2004 called The Transmission of Affect. That was very important for me. 
And, and I got to FAU um, where I discovered very quickly um, that Teresa had actually founded a PhD program for public intellectuals. Um, I soon discovered that she'd brought down many of the people that I most respected in the field. She'd brought, uh, you know, among others, Drusilla Cornell, Kelly Oliver. Um, she'd invited Spivak. Um, she'd brought Ansel Dua, Anthony Appiah. Mm -hmm. um, I just all these people that I'd really respected in my field had all been to FAU at this one particular moment, but, um, and this really speaks to what the panelists in the previous um, session had mentioned, especially Anne's beautiful story about, um, really heart-wrenching story about Hamilton, um, is this kind of erasure. Um, I'd found that uh, Teresa's memory wasn't what I thought it should be at FAU. And so um, I actually went on Google and I started looking for things and I was really, really lucky that the Pembroke Center features, um, features the different feminist archives that they have. I would never have just found that looking on Google in Brown's library. I don't think you can actually even search that. So if the Feminist Theory Archive hadn't made that very clear, I would never have found it. Um, so I actually, I applied for a research grant and I got to come up here last summer um, and I also uh, worked for the past, mm, gosh, gosh, two and a half years or so um, to host uh, Philosophia, which is an international feminist philosophy conference. Um, and I'm hosting it at the end of this month in her honor, actually. So um, it's a really exciting moment um, to get to, uh, I don't know, try to do justice to someone um, who I think... Uh, you know, I'm really, really interested in affect theory, and I find that, um, so, so Teresa Brennan, she died in a hit-and-run car crash in 2000, well, 2000, early 2003. She was in a coma for a few months. She was hit in December 2002, and she was only 50 when she was hit. Um, so Transmission of Affect was published posthumously, and um, her career, you know, she went into academia quite late. Her early first decade in her 20s, she was an activist. Um, she was doing activist work in Australia, where she was born, um, and in the UK. She actually came to America and worked for Barbara Mikulski, um, with a, a whole scandalous story that I can talk about in the Q&A. Um, but she, uh, you know, she made, uh, she was very tensional because uh, she had all these, you know, feminist, radical Marxist ideas, and, you know, other people didn't like that. But anyway, she had this whole activist career, and then she went to Cambridge in her 30s. So she really only published for about 10 years um, actively in the field, but she put out, like, four books. And actually, when I was in the archive, I found a whole manuscript um, that I would argue actually was essential to her thought. I found early drafts from like 1979, 1980, up until the end of her career. And nobody seems to have heard of it. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm so grateful to the Feminist Theory Archive for preserving this stuff. It, it, uh, you can't find much about Teresa Brennan online. You know, she, she died before the internet really boomed, and she died before affect theory boomed. But I would argue she's absolutely essential to that discourse, and I want to put her on the map there. Mm -hmm. A great, great story. Um, so, so Amy, um, as I'm looking through your bio and about all of your experiences, and most importantly, your experience as a Brown undergraduate student, um, I'm curious, um, through all of this, including your life at Brown, um, did you think about special collections as something you would use? Um, was, it, was it on your mind, and how do you think that it transformed your experience? So you're now looking at this with a little bit more distance um, than Shira is, um, but I'd be curious about what the impact has been on you. Yeah, I will say I still don't know how school is going to change my life. I think a lot of us don't. It always <laughs> is surprising. It's 12 a, that's, years that's a bigger. That's a bigger question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can say um, no. <laughs> so I grew up in a small town in northern Wisconsin, and uh, you know, nothing was really more than about 40 or 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So history, I mean, in terms of like built structures in my town, history wasn't really something that you know working class lumberjacks <laughs> aspired to study. And my parents. Um, probably still have panic attacks wondering what, what I'm doing. And so, no, I absolutely didn't. Um, but I think what, what sort of, what was really meaningful to me and what I still um, am drawn to in my study is the stories of people that sound very much like me or people that I know. Um, I, <laughs> I think it's 
probably also goes without saying that labeling yourself as a feminist in small town Wisconsin is kind of like setting yourself up for the witch trials. Um, if someone knows what it means. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, growing up in the middle of the woods and um, going to a small school, I, I think my ear was attuned to what some of those voices sound like and how hard you have to listen to hear certain stories, especially women's stories. And, um, you know, I was just naturally drawn to the oral histories that I uncovered during my research here. And, yeah, I think, I think when I realized what that special collections were really a foray into humanity and into the psyche and not just ephemera or, you know, pieces of paper that seemed <laughs> somehow impractical. Um, then I was really hooked and um, I, yeah, I think it, it's all how you, how you view it. The archive, if you, my experience opened me up to, to see it as so connected to humanity and to the soul of the stories I wanted to tell. And by using the actual words of those people, you could honor them much more in those stories. And I think they're much more powerful learning tools. And now I'm finishing my PhD in education in teaching and learning, which I didn't foresee coming either. But I use more special collections and more archival materials in my study now than I ever did when I was in history. And I think a lot of that is from my experience here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sets you apart from other, um, other people studying uh, in the same field? Yeah, I, I do, actually. I think just by virtue of me sitting here and getting into multiple PhD programs from the University of Minnesota Duluth, which is not um, necessarily <laughs> well known. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I had several people willing to you know, fund my research at um, really fantastic programs out here on the East Coast where there are more resources and I do study rural education um, and it's hard to find resources to do that. So I think I've been so surprised and so grateful for the interest that I've had from and support I've had from my mentors out here and I think it does, you know, does set me apart a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Peter, thank you um, so much. So Peter, I'm curious, in your mind, what is the significance of having the Pembroke Center uh, archives uh, available for your research? What, what is the significance for understanding feminist thought? Um, and what sort of impact do these archives have from your perspective? Well, I, I want to speak really quickly to Professor Hirsch from this morning. I, I'm not what you expected, but I'm Nicole, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I really, with a lot... <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I really took a lot, um, and I and I think there's an important sort of time. Cro there's an important time crossover that you know I'm trying to do something, and, and and you're thinking about this for the future and talking about it in the present. I mean, these things now with the archives are I think coming to a fore in a really sort of beautiful way. Um, the benefit of the archives is is in some of the ways you're talking about of, of trying to read these things almost contrapuntally with a lot of the, the, the texts we have, say, from Naomi Shore, reading in detail, or Bad Objects, her later text, um, and then trying to read it across again with the Differences Journal. There was a lot of the um, material, the theoretical material, that is enriched so much by, by reading into the archive. And the, um, the other thing that I found was that there was a whole history um, that probably you're all well aware of that for my generation of students had disappeared. It's called essentialist feminism and no one talks about it anymore. Um, and if you ask a student of, I just graduated last spring, if you ask a student my age, um, this is not common knowledge that this, is a, this exists or that, um, or it's okay to talk about it. Naomi has a really important sentence where she says, essentialism is anathema. I mean, you're not allowed to talk about it. And she's writing in the 90s. So you can imagine what's happened over 20 years. To be able to recover the history is not simply, 
it's not simply easy enough to just say, oh, we just have to go back and read what was taking place in the 80s. Um, it's about sort of reconstructing a history in a, um, in a way that can take into account what happened after, uh, right? So we want to resurrect possibilities from the 80s and prior, but it's not as simple as just resurrection. That would be the sort of nostalgia that we're talking about this morning. There is what I, I, I prefer reclamation to nostalgia, right? A way that you take opportunities that did exist then, but in light of the present, sort of bring them to light in new ways. And that's where I think the archives um, really open new possibilities because um, sometimes the books that are published then are sealed to some extent. They're, they're maybe a product of their times, but the archive I think has a little bit more of a, uh, it's a bit more open. It, 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 it does uh, attend to some, some new reconstructive possibilities. And so um, that's what I would sort of say is, 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 a, is a big benefit to having it to understand um, feminist theory in its current iteration and in its history. Mm -hmm. I wanted to open that question up to, to all the panelists, um, because I think in using those um, archives, you've thought about that, right? You've thought about it, how it relates to your teaching, how it relates to your learning. So what do you, what do you think about this? Um, what's the significance of having the archives? Why, why, do we, why do we need to have them? Why do we need to have them here? Why do they need to be focused in the way that they are? Sort of, what are some other thoughts? Thank you so much, Peter. Well, I think as <clears throat> Lauren and Peter noted, um, the archives are, in a sense, unfinished, right? They're, they're collections of, of people's lives. Um, they're not sealed, they're not polished, they're not finished manuscripts. In the case of, um, Elizabeth, of Mary Elizabeth Sharp, um, she didn't publish anything. Everything that's left of her are, are really her personal effects, um, letters and diaries and journals uh, and blueprint of the sci-li, you, you, things, things that weren't meant to be seen by the public. And I think that gives you so many more insights into people's thoughts, people's theories, their knowledge-making process than a, a finalized novel or ethnography would ever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think they're important because they tell our story, the people who lived here. Instead of reading just a normal book, history book, it's us. It's what connects us to them. These people lived in Providence. I lived in Providence. That's awesome. <laughs> to hear that these things did happen. and. That's how they experienced them. It's just, it's just, um, it's an unforgettable piece of history from a perspective of someone who's growing up in the same area as you are. It's just more impactful than just reading the general history. I want to add, um, so I work with the Feminist Theory Archive, and um, you know, it's an interesting thing to come up in philosophy and do feminist philosophy because mm. we don't really get an archive, right? Or that wasn't mm. ever part of my experience. So when I discovered this, it was a really big deal, right? Like I went to grad school with a bunch of people who were, you know, going to, you know, some German archive to study some dead German guy or some French guy or whatever, you know. There wasn't an archive mm. for people who did what I do. And there certainly wasn't a place um, that I knew of that was, you know, then I found, I found this archive and I found that so many people that I admire really deeply are giving their papers there after they retire, you know, and that that will all be kept someplace and stored and safe. And um, I don't know, the idea that, you know, I could come along and find Teresa's work and find it so transformative, you know, that will be transformative for all kinds of people that I can't even imagine. So I think that's really exciting and important. And I think it's important that it's physical too. Um, going back to what Shira was saying about being in the archive, um, it's weird, I've only spent six days there of my whole life, but like some of my most exciting experiences in the past few years have been, um, really in my whole graduate school career, have been you know, going through these files and finding that Teresa made a uh, graphic novel, a photographic novel in like the mid 80s, right? And she wrote an autobiography when she was about my age, 
you know, and it's, it's in five parts. It's wonderful. Some of it's handwritten. I, and, 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 you know, and just finding these things where, you know, I never met this person. I, you know, she died when I was, what, 16 or 17. Like, I didn't even know who she was when she died. But I feel this closeness to her that I'm not sure I deserve to feel. But I do, and I, I you know, I, I find, you know, friends of hers, and I get them to tell me stories about her, and there's this uh, closeness that I think maybe you can only, maybe you can get that in a digital archive, too, I don't know, but there's something about, you know, coming across her little post-its, right? I mean, thinking back to, to Dr. Hirsch's talk earlier, right, those, those post-its where sometimes I can't make out all the words, right? I mean, uh, one time when I was here over the summer, I, there was a hair, right? There was a hair, I mean, and it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's this material stuff that you just could never see unless you're sitting there with the files. So I'm so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna echo what Michelle said as well and just um, add a plug for the oral histories because I think, um, you know, I had originally come here to study oral history and Brown has a really unique strong tradition of preserving those recordings, but I had no idea at the time that I would go on to, um, now I'm doing my dissertation with Carol Gilligan, a feminist psychologist, and you know, she's kind of, a lot of, a lot of theorists are going in and, and reconceiving of how we listen to interviews, and um, particularly with you know, populations like the Native American Ojibwe population I'm working with, and to actually have those voices on tape and to be able to listen to, um, Peter, you had mentioned like the contrapuntal voices, and to actually listen to that interplay and to make that part of the story and part of the history is really powerful, and that's something that originally, you know, captivated me when I was listening to random people's interviews online, which is how I found the piece I ended up writing, which got me here. I had no idea who it was. I was just clicking on, um, I came across a guy in the, the women's oral history archive, and I was like, oh, interesting. Click on it. And then, you know, 10 hours mm -hmm. later, um, <laughs> I've tried to trace him back to every other person that could possibly be connected to him. But to have those, those voices, um, actually on tape is, is really powerful for scholarship going forward, especially as you know, we're reconceiving of it right now. Great, I think this would be a great idea. Um, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and um, move into questions. Are there mics? <laughs> are, there, are, there, are there microphones available for I think it's been a great panel and I'm really excited to hear que questions from this pretty amazing audience. I'm wondering, um, would it have been helpful to have a timeline included with the archive so as you're listening to different histories, you can sort of place these people in real time? Great question. Uh, I kind of did because they are by decade and they kind of had um, by like when they graduated. So with mine for the 1920s, I got everyone from 1920 to 1929. So I could kind of place them right where they um, were. I didn't know their ages, but I knew they talked about the same type of things. And, and it was great to hear actual multiple people talking about the same thing making it even more real. I, I wanted to um, ask Lauren a question, because of course it's very exciting to have a major feminist theorist with a new manuscript. So how did this manuscript fit in the oeuvre? And why was it so many years being worked on but never came forth? And did it change anything essential that you thought you knew about Brennan? Mm. Well, so I mean, the age of paranoia is what it's called. Um, and she, uh, she wrote an essay version of it, actually. It was one of her first published essays, but the essay is super different from this text. This text is something like 350 pages long. And uh, it's a, so, so what, what she purports to set out to do, I think part of, it was, it was never published. She did try to publish it. Um, 
a, a few times. Uh, it, was, it was an odd text. So she's trying to reinvent the self-help genre, essentially. She thinks that the self-help genre was once the province of philosophy. It used to be of philosophers, and the self-help genre has become this commercial thing that tells you what you're supposed to want, and so she wants to take that back. And so she's thinking about um, our, our culture of paranoia, and she begins the book talking about an academic conference. Right? Very different from right, this sort of um, the, the toxic sort of um, competitive energy um, of an academic conference. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and she's just going through all of these different sort of instances right, of, of a sort of paranoid age. Um, but that's not the end of it, right? She, she's thinking about what do we do there. Um, so I found the Age of Paranoia. I also found another text. Um, this text wasn't finished. Uh, she'd written a proposal for it. It's about 60 pages. And this is what I take to be, I think, um, Brennan's maybe solution or her answer um, to this paranoia. So I found, um, I found this other text. It's um, even odder, arguably. Um, it's called The Lost Myth of the Ancient Rite of Christening. Um, and essentially, what Teresa Brennan did, so, um, oh, sorry, am I not close enough? Sorry. So essentially what Teresa Brennan did, so um, one of the things that I find really fascinating about her, um, and I think I said this before, is the way that she was really not just thinking about but actually doing feminist kinship in a way that I really admire. So this text was written for Alice Chardin's adopted child, in, adopted daughter in uh, the late 90s. And she wrote, essentially, a, a kind of a pluralistic, multicultural uh, ritual, right, uh, to welcome this child into the world. And it combines elements of um, lots of different Chinese, Taoist, um, Jewish, uh, combines lots of different elements. Uh, and, and it was this ritual to uh, essentially welcome this child into the world and essentially uh, celebrate this kind of reconnection, overcoming our paranoia and thinking about our um, connection to one another. And it's, it's this really beautiful myth, but it's odd, right? And so, so finding these, that text for me, um, that was really exciting for me as well as, as a kind of an answer to this paranoia, right? Because how do we overcome that, right? We find, um, I mean, it was a ritual in a sense, right? We find ways of, um, of coming together and reconnecting and, um, and, and yeah, and, and, and thinking about it as, as trying to welcome this child into a different kind of set of kinship relations um, just really was moving to me. So um, my question is about contrapuntal reading that Peter brought up. So I have to say that um, the idea of being archived is terrifying to me. I really mm -hmm. didn't want to talk about that today because it was too self-revealing. But when I first got the letter from Pembroke saying, send your paper, would you send your papers? First of all, mm -hmm. I didn't know what papers I had. I had a bunch of messy file mm -hmm. cabinets and a lot of notebooks and a lot of stuff that was under the desk and in various boxes. and. I don't know what papers are and why they would be interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this day has been completely illuminating, especially this panel, mm -hmm. to figure out you know, who would be interested mm -hmm. in this work and why, and how could it be used. Mm -hmm. So I understand from Lauren that um, what you found in Teresa Brennan's boxes brought her alive to you. And she was somebody who was an important thinker, who had published important books, one posthumously, but prematurely left us. So there might have been a lot more stuff, but, and um, you didn't have a chance to know her in that way because of that, uh, also mm -hmm. because of the, how young it, she died. And with Naomi Shore, it's a similar story where a lot mm -hmm. of the work is unfinished um, because again, it was a very premature ending to a brilliant career. Um, if you finish a career, and I notice I, mm -hmm. you know, set my donation in the future because I still can't figure out how I would organize mm -hmm. or even put into a box what I would give. So mm -hmm. I'm still interested in beyond um, the, the personal, beyond mm -hmm. the person, and, and, and I, I feel like you have to be a pretty interesting person to uh, connect with someone in a younger generation to, and thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, um, what is the, you know, are you reading, the individual items against the published work? Is it, does it enrich the ideas of the published work? Is there more there than that? Um, you know, I think the example you gave about the graphic novel and the letter are perfect because they fill out this image of mm -hmm. this person. Uh, but I'm still not clear on 
why beyond learning about this person the papers are interested? Yeah. I, so I, I also want to, um, I think it's a great question. I want to um, sort of punt that over to Michelle a little bit too, because um, I think what you're doing with um, the archives is slightly different. Um, and I think it, it adds another component. So I, I, I'd love to hear from all of the panelists, but I, I just want to make sure that I shunt that over to Michelle a bit. Um, as I had stated earlier, it's not about just having the facts there, it's about hearing them. Like, when I listen to the, the oral histories, and I listen to like 12 of them, and over 10 hours of audio, um, I just sat there, closed my eyes, and it was like they were there. They were talking to me. And it just adds that layer of, this was real. Uh, uh, we did the 1920s, and to me, um, the prohibition, it felt like it's, it's not like it wasn't real, but it, it, it just feels like, wow, this actually really did happen? And that's what the audio did for me. It added that this did happen, this did happen. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how um, people who are like 20 years old or so will be like, there was a time without computers? And they'd be like, yes, yes there was. And this is what it was like. And that's why these mm -hmm. oral histories are so important because especially the ones we're doing now, because I, I, when I looked online, I'm not really sure um, if it's just about post uh, them being up on the archive um, website or not, but it seems like they're fewer and fewer as the years go on. And 1990s, there was two. I'm like, when during the 1920s, there was like 22. Um, and I wish people would just speak up. They would, um, just give your oral histories. You, you, they may not think that your history is important, but it's important. And it will be important 100 years from now when people hear it. And they're like, oh, that really did happen? Trump did get elected? Yes. Yes, it did. And this is what's going to happen. Um, it just adds that layer of reality that this is happening. And this is what's hap happening for it. So we can look back and be like, okay, maybe we shouldn't have done this, or maybe that should have been this way and not, and not that way. Should we have prohibition again? Nah, probably not, because <laughs> this is what happened. Um, and these true stories are what makes things, these mean, uh, it meaningful. Hi, can I also, um, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of documents that we don't have access to um, you know, when I was looking at the Differences Journal, we don't take a journal to be something that has, you know, doesn't really have publications or uh, we don't see a person behind it a lot of the time. Some of the yeah. most interesting things that I found with the journal were the correspondences between the, um, uh, for the founding, the, the um, editorial board and advisory board corresponding. And the reason it was so interesting is because, one, we don't have access to those things, generally. Those things are not published. Um, but the problems that, w problems, productive problems that were taking place at the outset of the journal continue to t until today. Um, to take one example, I, I think, or at least so, so far as I'm working this out in, the, in what I'm researching, a lot of um, the question of essentialism and anti-essentialism revolves around psychoanalysis. The origin of Differences Journal, that's a very poignant question that's posed by a lot of the editorial and advisory board. There's two options we have. Um, difference can just be an idea. It can be an idea related to race, or it can be related to class, or sexual difference, or gender. That's another. So there could be just difference as a general concept, or there could be that differences the journal was going to declare um, that sexual difference was the most important thing. That was the paradigm of all difference. And they went on to publish a book called The Essential Difference. And so these questions that were um, taking place at the outset, the advisory board, I remember clearly Jacqueline Rose's letter. Jacqueline Rose said, I want to know, is psychoanalysis the discourse or not? You know, <laughs> it's pretty clear, you know, she, she, she wanted to ask. Um, 
Those questions still continue to today. I mean, uh, the great thing about the Differences Journal was that it's posing it as a question always, and, and it's being revised and tweaked, and what happened later with Differences taking up all too sere is another spin on it. But my point is that where we don't have access to those things, reading it contrapuntally would be to say, here's some source material that we don't have access to, but it's really uh, enlightening for understanding the development of the journal of Pembroke, and then in the largest sense, in a broader sort of genealogy of certain developments within feminism. And so what I was really interested in is, is reading these three things at a crossroads um, with the material from the archives that no one, uh, you know, they wouldn't see the light of day otherwise. I think to add to that, um, I, I mentioned that Mary Elizabeth Sharp didn't publish anything, um, novel, ethnography, et cetera, but she was very well known in pretty much her entire life for her excellence in landscape architecture, both on mm -hmm. Brown's campus and in Providence. And so you can see remnants of her work on campus today. The most famous, of course, would be the Sharp Refectory, which is named after her, after her husband, Henry, who was chancellor for about 20 years in um, the early to mid-1900s. Mm -hmm. And she, she dressed, so to speak, the, the Sharp Refectory with the bushes, the shrubbery that surrounds it. Um, so that was that was her professional mark. And and to your point about dancing on this line of personal and professional, why these archives are important, alongside all of her letters and affix and whatnot, were meticulous notes about things that she needed to remind maintenance about. She would take these long walks around campus and note trellises that were falling apart and ivies that needed to be cut, um, stones that had to be replaced, bushes that needed to be chopped and, 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 and spruced up and whatnot. Um, and it, it, like Michelle was saying, it, it shades the history uh, of, of the campus in this, in this sense. Um, and, as Peter was saying, in uh, academic work and another. Um, it gives you, it, it, cr it creates a fuller picture of, of the thought and that, of the thought that went into the work. Thank you. Um, do you have a mic? Okay. Um, could, could I just add, I'm sure you saw these materials as well, that um, one, one conceptualization of Mary Elizabeth Sharp is as the wife of, the wife of the chancellor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work that she did on lands, calling it landscape architecture is one thing. A lot of people at Brown thought she was just a busybody who was the wife of the chancellor and messed around with it. Although during World War II, Henry Merritt Riston mm -hmm. um, essentially retained her to run buildings and grounds because all the men were away. Mm -hmm. But as I'm sure you saw, she had quite a wild life before she married Henry Sharp. She, she, was, uh, uh, she ran uh, a business. She went to Europe during World War I with the Red Cross, essentially, for, for the adventure of it. At one point, she went out west, uh, as I recall. To, uh, and so that the archive that you've described quite correctly as you know, her sort of peaceable life as the wife as the wife of doing architecture, was hardly foreshadowed by the life she led before that, right. um, which is also very interesting. And I, I found that archive fascinating because in some sense she seems to have lived almost two lives. Yeah, I, I ended up writing the piece for my English class about her work in relation yeah. to Brown. I don't quite remember what the prompt was, but it must have, it must have asked us to talk about how this person related to the Brown and Providence in particular. But yes, many of her letters indicated that she was very interested in their political and social standing. She, she, I, don't, I don't think she's a busybody. I thought she was brilliant, and she was so discerning and meticulous, and it was obvious that she was very, I mean, she was a very sharp woman. Um, I'm so sorry for that pun. Wait, um, <laughs> we have the comedy portion just continuing later. She, yeah, she, she held her own in, in the letters before um, Henry took 
office as chancellor in the 1930s, um, she, bo both of them would travel extensively, which was so foreign to me, um, because in, in my conceptualization of, of my own great-grandparents' lives, and I think of m many people who lived in the 1930s, I never would have guessed a woman just traveling on her own to Washington, D.C. to interact with these socialites and these politicians without the, the supervision of her husband. So that was, while it didn't end up in my, in my piece, that was fascinating to me and inspiring because she must have been incredibly strong-willed. So yes, that's that's a total reaffirmation of what you just said. And there are mics. Can, yeah, there. Is there a second? Is there a second mic? I just wanted to. Yeah, Marianne, where are you? You can't mean your question because everything you said this morning answered what you, what yeah. you just asked. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was such a wonderful talk. All I want to say is that in my recollection, when we started the archives, both sets of archives, we wanted to make sure that people did not forget that there were all of these troublemakers around. It was about mm -hmm. making trouble. And we hope it still is. And that's what you were talking about this morning. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. One of the things that uh, I've been, one of the things I've been really um, moved by, surprised by, to be completely honest with you, um, is the courage of some of the topics that the women who've contributed interviews to Brown Women Speak have been willing to to discuss and to talk about in their interviews, knowing that these interviews are going to be shared. Um, and the research that you did around women trying to gain access to birth control mm -hmm. um, and reproductive health prior to Roe v. Wade is a standout component of these interviews by far. Um, and another one that I had mentioned this morning to Johanna is now evidence of this very troubling practice of posture pictures that took place in the 60s. And they're recounted by, by inter people who t contributed interviews in lighthearted fashion, but they're hitting on a place of pain and, and something that was unjust that happened here. And the, these women are making history. And no one's, we're going to cover this now. Like, this is for the record, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, I feel like your question, and along with Dr. Hirsch's question, are, are similar, at least my perspective, for this project that I worked on. Um, I think that's <laughs> what drew me to these histories in the first place was a feeling of kinship and understanding that I, I had with these courageous women. I mean, I grew up in a, a fundamentalist religious family, and you can imagine, you know, 20 something girl at, at, at Brown from the Midwest, like, I didn't even know it, what liberal meant. <laughs> um, I'd gone to Christian college, and I thought that maybe it would be good to, like, expand my horizons. And, you know, it can be a little, like, a little disorienting, but uh, I, when I was reading the experiences of these women and men um, that were involved in this story, uh, I really felt like I, I understood that. Like, this was a story that speaks to me and, um, you know, the courage that, of, of women that I know that they have in their life right now um, talking about similar issues. And um, that's kind of the, I think, the timelessness of, of some of these stories and of the archive um, across different, different times and spaces. And, I think <laughs> stories of, of courage, particularly uh, women's courage, never go out of style. And I think they're inspiring to such a broad range of women from very different backgrounds. Um, even people like me that came a little late to the Brown Party. But um, I think like very many women who went through here, you know, this was a space where they they fought to find their voice. And, um, you know, those stories of that struggle or the trouble in the archive, I think, are, are really powerful. 
because we still go through that struggle today um, in different in different ways and and for very many different girls <laughs> and guys that you know that start at Brown right now these are stories that just seem incredibly relevant and I think at least in this this is the time in my adult life that I felt most need for inspiration being a young woman and feeling like um, I wasn't quite sure where we were headed or feeling like I was being torn back to where I came from. And so, yeah, I think these, these stories um, are very powerful and very necessary right now. I um, just have a general question. Um, and then I want to offer the, the so my general question is, and I wanted to give the context, um, is what would be the best approach from, the, your user, from your user perspective? The best approach to maintain sort of continuous prompts so that that connection and that inspiration can go over an indefinite period of time. And the reason that I'm asking is that I was sitting at the movies, and spoiler alert if anyone's seen Hidden Figures, but I'm sitting at the movies with my 95-year-old mom, and I'm elbowing her in the middle of the movie, going, that's me. That's me. Because my, my sophomore summer job was at the Naval Underwater System Center to program the IBM computer. And I remember having Fortran manual in my hand. And I was like, I didn't know she existed. It took 50 years for that connection and that inspiration. So I see this as an opportunity not to let 50 years go by before there's some undergrad who is in a situation. And I don't know what we can do about that, so that's my question is, what are the continuous prompts to make sure the voices of those people don't take 50 years to reach us? Because the 95-year-old is starting to not be interested in being um, extroverted. She's becoming very introverted. So we have to pull that out of them. And I'm sorry, I For the oral histories, they're from when they graduated. Why aren't we doing them now? Why aren't we talking to the graduates now and saying, hey, can we just interview you and get your thoughts on how life is right now? Uh, what are your fears? What's society like? I think that would be awesome instead of getting it 50 years from then. Um, I think that would help a lot. And putting them online is awesome because um, I was accessible to it. And I didn't think I would, would be able to find oral histories. But having them online and accessible like that so I can read them in the middle of the night because that's what I do um, was really great. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I would say um, it, it might be interesting if when something comes up, we, we don't think in terms of the future, but we think in terms of like turning to the archives. And, and the reason I say it is because um, I know we like to crack a lot of Trump jokes and we tend to think about it as this new formation and this, this new thing we're experiencing and what's going to happen in the future. But um, one very important document that I found was um, it was a proposal when um, f for funding that the Pembroke Center was seeking um, from the Rockefeller Foundation. And they, were, they said we're going to have two thematic um, events. One was going to be on the cultural construction of gender. The other was going to be on, the, again, the idea of nostalgia, but specifically now about nostalgia as a conservative affect. Right? So the idea that if only we could go back to this time, et cetera, et cetera. When this was all taking place was 80s, was the Reaganite era. Mm -hmm. And so nostalgia was understood as if only we can return to that glorious time when men were X, when women were, you know, back to domestic roles. Nostalgia was a very conservative effect and one that was being mobilized in the 80s while Pembroke was, um, you know, trying to apply for its funding, et cetera. Well, the more that I see what's happening, when we hear that slogan, make America great again, I mean, that again is nostalgia. And it's nothing new. And it's, I mean, it's almost word for word some of the stuff that was being written on this proposal to the Rockefeller Foundation 
30, 40 years ago. And the wonderful thing about what Differences in Pembroke Center was doing then was to say, um, we don't just want to say, of course, this is horrible, et cetera, et cetera, but how is it possible that at the moment when uh, conservative gender roles are being mobilized, Pembroke Center can do something about the cultural construction of gender? There's some discord there, right? There's an important tension. Uh, there's some inside, outside, inside the center, outside the center that's going on. How can we celebrate today? It's wonderful, of course. While you know, these things take place outside, and always thinking about that you know, productive uh, tension as nothing new, as something that you know, Pembroke specifically, if we only want to talk about the Pembroke Center, has been thinking about since it was founded. If we make that change to, okay, when something that we think is new comes, we don't think towards the future and think about it as new, but we say, okay, time to turn to the archives. What are the histories that have dealt with this in the past? What were the people that were fighting it then, causing trouble back then? Um, and how do we resurrect the troublemakers, basically? So I don't know how many people here have seen I Am Not Your Negro, because what it connects to what Peter just said, that's based on a proposal that Baldwin wrote for a film that he never got to make, or was it a book? It was a film that he never got to make, and this was the film based on the archival mm -hmm. documents that were found. And you know, so I'm thinking, what an amazing opportunity that you know proposal left, and. I was thinking it might be so interesting to collect proposals, not the, not the books we write after the proposals, not the projects we do, uh, because the proposals are about aspiration and uh, futurity, and um, sort of for a telling of history of women and feminism, that might be a really interesting, um, th those might be really interesting documents to study. So this is for the students. <laughs> no, but start, to start to look at them at some point from different periods, that's what I We all look at the writing we do every day and that our friends do every day through emails as a as sort of a renaissance of the epistolary <laughs> and that you actually print the most beautiful letters, the letters that you mm -hmm. get from your friends, especially your friends who don't see themselves as scholars or artists or important people, but people who love to write. Those people are using email now as a way to express themselves in this really fantastic way. But it's all getting lost in all your, your sort of, your, his, your archive, which you think is going to last forever, um, which is your emails and how many of us used to have AOL and then we don't and, oh, well, we lost 10 years. And we had two or three friends who m wrote. And everybody knows the 90s were really a period of eloquence in email. We all know that. But you either have it and you saved it or you printed it out. And I just think that it's very important to be collaborators with people who don't put themselves on a pedestal yet, but just write beautifully. Can I speak to that real quick? Please. Yeah, one of the most amazing things about Teresa Brennan's papers, and I, I don't exactly know who did this. I, she might have done it. It might have been after she died. But um, essentially, like every email, um, you know, she died in 2002, right? So all through the 90s, every email um, is there. And that was really interesting, or I think every email's there. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, that was really fascinating for me um, in terms of seeing personal connections, but it was also really productive because, you know, I, I, um, I'm at Florida Atlantic where she was, where she started 
a PhD program. And one of the things that was most interesting is it's from her emails that I know about that original vision. It's from her emails that I see the meeting minutes. Um, and that, you know, as my school has, you know, actually, it's, it's funny, people just kind of reinvent the wheel sometimes. But, you know, my school's doing this whole peace, justice, and human rights initiative now, which is wonderful. And I'm involved in it. But there's no historical memory, um, as far as I can see, of what my school was doing 15 years ago. And I get that in the emails. Um, it, there's no record that I have other than those emails. Um, so they're wonderful. I just wanted to add uh, onto this issue about people who are you know, not intellectuals and what about them in the archive. Because my own experience with doing archives is in two places. One was doing stuff on Rhode Island factory women in Central Falls and their families. And so I did interviews. People who worked with me did interviews with men and women. But I found some historical oral histories. One set at URI, which was about early workers in various mills around Rhode Island. And another set on French Canadians was up at the Central Falls Library. And both of them were incredibly frustrating for what you didn't get out of them. Because the ones at URI, the, the interviewers clearly didn't know a hell of a lot about mill work. So they would ask things about, how did you take your lunch to work or something? And the actual work process, which I was really interested in, just hardly was there. And the French Canadian stuff was, was kind of truncated in another kind of way. So my first experience as an anthropologist who spends time talking to people and doing participant observation and hit interviews was working with historical documents is totally frustrating. <laughs> uh, and then I, I've also done some work on uh, Gladys Riker, who is a a woman anthropologist from the 1930s, and there were other things about that archive, because there wasn't an oral history, and so I've never heard her voice. Uh, <clears throat> and there, there also were things I wanted to know that I could not find out from the, you know, any archival material. And I got a little bit when I interviewed somebody who actually knew her, but there were things like, she was, she was at, at Barnard, and there was this sudden you know, death of a guy who was an older scholar who she was probably having an affair with and that created some incredible uproar and she almost got herself fired from Barnard. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want to know more about that, but there's no like letters or anything else like that. Um, so I found archives incredibly frustrating. But I think one of the things I'm getting out of this is the way in which the, a deep set of archives can talk to each other and ways in which there can be connections to various kinds of you know, oral histories, objects in archives, et cetera, et cetera, that can, you know, get a full, a full picture of something if there are, the connections can be made between the pieces of paper, the tapes, pictures, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is very hopeful in the sense of, you know, making it possible to do more things with archives than historians have been able to. So Louise, I think that goes to a point that was made earlier about the necessity for the um, person conducting the interview to be really prepared and to mm -hmm. prepare the person who is being interviewed. I think one of the, um, as I'm sitting here mulling through this conversation and the question asked about by Professor Hirsch uh, about why a professor with an uninteresting life, in quotes, uh, would donate, um, would really spend time uh, preparing an archive. I, the recurrent theme here is that there's something very humanistic about the archive. And historically, the archive has excluded um, most people in society. But in the 20th century especially, in part because of um, the justice movements domestically and around the world, we've been able to um, add dimension to the archive. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, 
uh, the story, the individual story, is the earliest narrative among human beings. It, it, it helps us make meaning out of life. It connects us to someone else. Um, it's existential. And, and that's what's so important about the oral history. Like we, we, I mean, this has been said previously, we live in a world of conflict and um, adversity, and uh, we need to be inspired. And we are inspired through the work, both intellectual and emotional, of others. Um, so I, I'm I'm saying I'm saying this as an historian. I my my uh, mentor here at. At Brown, uh, Suzanne Obler, who was the first Latino studies professor hired, uh, we were embattled. I, that's a recurrent theme in my life, clearly. <laughs> um, and at some point she told me, whatever you write about is going to be autobiographical. And I was like, absolutely not. I was critical of identity <laughs> politics. Um, uh, and I, I fought it all the way to hell. Uh, but ultimately, we, are, we, we do what we do in the academy and in the world because, of, because we're trying to resolve some internal issue, problem. And, and the archive is, a, is a, a means through which to, um, to do that. And so, and so you need to go back there and get all your post-its and your crazy files. And uh, because, because of the talk you gave this morning, mm -hmm. which was brilliant academically, but it had so many human dimensions to it. Um, and when I was, I came in late, but when I was listening, I thought, oh, I, I, want, I want to know more. I actually want to read it. I want to I see what these things that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not in your field, but whatever it is that you do would enrich my life and ultimately make me a better academic. Could I speak to that? Absolutely. So I've been thinking about um, the question that the woman towards, I'm sorry, I don't know many of your names. I feel like I should, because you're all very smart people. Um, so um, the woman who posed the question about how do we make sure that we keep prompting each other. So I think this conversation sort of been circling around this idea. I think it's uh, how do we keep prompting each other to do this type of research? Well, I think on, on one hand, I had a professor who literally gave us a written prompt that we had to answer. Um, and so it's an opportunity to look at the archives, to dig into these histories. And then the second question is, how are we making sure that we're asking the right questions, that we get the information that, that we want, or in some cases need? I, um, Dean Waddell, mentioned that I work for the Brown Daily Herald, which of course has its implications. People aren't necessarily mm -hmm. willing to talk to me um, because of the reputation of the paper, which I understand. I, I realize that that precedes me. Um, but I'm also an anthropologist. And I, I know that the best way to get answers to questions is to simply ask something and then stand back and let someone talk. And the, the, the key, of course, is to make sure that that first question is pointed and, and con conscientious of someone's uh, background, that it's, it's appropriate, that it, it doesn't... I guess a really good example is um, I recently read um, Catherine Detweiler's memoir about her research in uh, about mal malnutrition in Mali, and she has a scene where she keeps asking these the same question over and over about um, when the people eat meat, and they say, "Well, when we kill a goat," and she's like, "Well, when do you kill the goat?" Every so often, and she it's the circular conversation that never gets to a straight answer. So the the problem, of course, is is trying to get a quote unquote straight answer, and that means asking the right questions. And so this goes back to what you were just saying about being inclusive and making sure that we're, we're bringing in voices that have historically been excluded, and that means being culturally conscious 
and competent towards one another and making sure that we know how to ask the right questions, that we're not being offensive or degrading, um, that we're, we're willing to open ourselves up to the answers um, that we might not want to hear, but that in the end give a better representative archive of, of people's histories. I don't know if that answered anything. Um, but that's, that, those are all the themes that I'm picking out from, everyone, from what everyone's saying. It's, it's, it's not as simple as just asking questions um, of just receiving prompts. It's a question of, of bringing all of this together in, in forward-thinking work. Okay. Can I speak to so, that, um, please? Um, because with the, the archives that I listened to, there was no one person that was more important. It was, seemed like it was just going across whoever wants to talk. And I thought that was just as emotionally impactful as someone who's extremely important. Um, and I think it's, it was very, it's great to hear from the normal person. That, and you don't know if they're gonna be important later on either. It could be, it could, they could be important when they've deceased. And then you'd go back and then be like, great, I'm glad that they actually did that because now I can learn more about them. Um, that, that's all I need to say on that. Thank you, so I hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists. I, I have a And is it a quick question? Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's actually more, okay. more a comment than a, okay. than a question. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I just want to say that, um, you know, like Mary Ann, when I got the letter asking for my papers, I thought, papers? You know, what do they mean? Like, grocery receipts? I, <laughs> I, I don't know. And I, I say that as someone who, you know, actually um, had been asked to be the, the literary executor for someone, actually uh, um, another Brown alum, um, the, the novelist Shirley Ann Williams, shortly before she died, asked me to be her literary executor, and I didn't really know what that job entailed, but I couldn't say, I couldn't exactly say no. But, um, you know, the idea again, as I said earlier, of uh, that I would have papers that anybody would want, you know, just didn't register. Ultimately, I think for us as scholars, we just live our lives and do our work. And in that regard, I really want to both thank and applaud this panel of young scholars because we don't give value to our work. You do. And I really want to thank you for that. Thank you.